passion of the Christ to crucify this. You know how to use one of these? You know how to use one of these? This July, let he who is without sin kick the first ass. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Nick's Nonfiction. I'm your host, comic Nick Munez. We've got a truly divine episode ahead of us to celebrate the merry and gay spirit of the day. You feel it in the air, don't you? We're celebrating the birth of our Savior with the Jeffersonian Bible this month, written by Thomas Jefferson. Maybe you guys started celebrating early, trampling grandmothers in Walmart on Black Friday. We got Kwanzaa this month. (laughs) This is going to be a truly great show today. It is the best story ever told. I went to church every Sunday growing up. This is a Jew-friendly show, a Muslim-friendly show. It is all of the fat cut off the Bible. The First Testament, gone. That's when God's like, sacrifice your son to me. You're not allowed to masturbate. We are talking about Second Testament, the life of Jesus Christ. He was a hippie, he was an entertainer, and he was the son of God. The entire message this guy was preaching was forgiveness and blowing up the Roman banking debt ponage debtor's prison system that was going on at the time. These people couldn't read and they were being taken advantage of by the banks. We'll draw some parallel to a modern day, but we're celebrating the holidays. We're going to keep it merry and bright. And may all your Jeffersonian Bibles be conservative right. (laughs) There are definitely some traditional values in today's show. Jesus, though, was not a upper echelon guy. You see, he slums it. He hung out with all of the prostitutes, overcame adversity. He would get a job anywhere. The most famous man to ever live. And this book does not go through all of the lost years. It's rumored that he went and studied over in India. Some of his teachings are more Buddhist than you would think. We're going over the Sermon on the Mount, the Parable of the Sower. All of these classic stories, great messages to get us through the season of giving. Let's get into this author, Thomas Jefferson. Might have heard of the guy. Born in the States, Virginian, April 13th of 1743, lived until 1825, and he died on the 4th of July. One of the first, first generation Americans, the third out of 10 children. His parents were of English and wealth descent, went to College of William and Mary. That one's in Virginia, and he was always a bright kid. Went when he was 16. He studied mathematics, metaphysics, philosophy. His favorite philosophers were John Locke, Bacon, Thomas Hobbes, who we read a couple months ago, and he mentioned Newton. He knew calculus, all that good stuff. He's trajecting the stars from uh, Jesus' entire life story. Jefferson inherited eight square miles of land on his 21st birthday, got into all of that land management. He amassed a 1,200-book library, got really into politics, and then represented Virginia. He was like the smartest guy with a farm, and they just picked him to represent. He was at all the Continental Congress meetings. He drafted the Declaration of Independence. All men created equal inalienable rights. <laughs> the birth of freedom. Thomas Jefferson uh, was good friends with Dr. Benjamin Rush. They would talk to each other about religion all the time. And in 1781, Dr. Rush was able to convince Jefferson to write his own version of the Bible. Published in 1803. Took him 20 years to cut down the friggin' 3,000 word Bible. We're going to get it into hour and hour and a half today. Jefferson saw he wanted to separate church and state and he wanted his American constituents to get along. He saw Lutheranism, Baptism, Catholicism, Christian. I mean, they're all under the branch of Christianity. The point is why you have like one different thing between the rules you follow. The priest can get married in this church, but not in this other denomination. Thomas Jefferson is going, I'm cutting all of that crap out of the Bible. We are just going over the history of Jesus. Jefferson had a (laughs) thing or two to say about the Jews. It seems like he didn't hold them in high regards. 
that's uh, one of the things pushed to the side about history. I mean, Thomas Jefferson's getting dragged through the mud right now because he had sex with his slaves. He was procreating more minorities. He was doing everyone a favor. I mean, but this guy wrote the fucking declaration. You can't hold people to the standards of 2020 who lived 300 years ago. Thomas Jefferson, he bought more people who were all just God-loving people together in the early beginnings of America. Unfortunately, there's no Jeffersonian Torah or a Jehovah Quran. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson is like, it doesn't matter what denomination you are, what day you celebrate the Sabbath, as long as you emulate Christ's values, you are carrying on the religion. We got eight parables today. We're not doing chapters. This is an epic saga. Starts with Parable 1, Bethlehem Backstory. Joseph and Mary, they were heading to Bethlehem to have their little baby Jesus. And as the mythical story goes, they followed the stars over to Bethlehem. Jefferson was going. Joseph actually had family in Nazareth right by Bethlehem. So they stayed on the outskirts of town while they had the baby. He was uh, talking about the star records do not line up. He took his compass out and trajected the star patterns. And he was saying it probably took place sometime in the summer. And uh, if you know anything about, like, the pagan, the people that used to worship the land, they used to call this the winter solstice on the December 25th. It's basically just a holiday to say the harvest is over. It's about to be, as Joe Biden would say, a dark winter ahead. This is, like, our last celebration. And they also said the pagan holidays, they would take mushrooms and give each other stuff on... um, December 25th. So these are really where the roots of the holiday, the consumerist holiday that we manipulate into Christmas here. It's not the Tannenbaum from Germany and all these countries celebrate Christmas differently. It's really just about the birth of little baby Jesus. If you want to see all the details to that, walk into any church in your town in the entire month of December. There will be children putting on a nativity scene. You know, the three kings bring the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Go watch Family Guy. They have a thing where baby Stewie flies around and (laughs) shoots them with lasers. I'll try to be as sacrilegious for the joke today. It came to pass in those days, Jefferson wrote, the days that Christ was born, Caesar Augustus decreed that all of the world shall be taxed. And if you know Roman history, real brief, the Roman army was built for mobility. Like they did that Spartan thing where they held the shields on the sides, front and top, so it was a tank made of men. They could go around to different city-states all around the world into Persia and collect people's money, collect taxes. And Caesar Augustus, the big honcho at the time, is saying, what is this big star business going down? Feels like some deity was just born. Time to kick up the Roman Empire into phase three, taxation. This is why a lot of those Enlightenment thinkers around, you know, founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, cherished uh, the story of Jesus so much. He was one of the OGs to, to say, taxation is theft, libertarian concept, the best philosophy on earth. Let's keep the narrative going. Roman army was huge. They were mobile for collecting taxes. So Joseph, he was raising uh, Jesus in Bethlehem. That kind of glazes over the first 12 years of his life. And I'm sorry, that was in Nazareth. So he was just born in Bethlehem. He goes by Jesus of Nazareth. He reps his hood. That's where he spent the first 12 years of his life. And when they were 12, Joseph and Mary moved to Jerusalem. This is the big city at the time. He was a bright kid. People knew the grace of God was upon him. They would leave Jesus alone in the middle of the busiest parts of Jerusalem, saying, like, go be a teenager. And they would come back, and he was in a temple talking to doctors. He wasn't uh, screwing around as much as the other kids. Either the best little Jewish boy ever, or he brewing something up. Hebrew? Hebrew? Come on! Mary really wasn't mentioned a lot in the raising. Like, after the birth, she's kind of out of the picture. Joseph took him into these uh, first years of his life. He was a single father, and no one believed even Joseph at the time, but he was like, this is God's child right here. None of you see it yet. No one believed Joseph. Joseph was kind of pushed to the side as well. 
And thus starts Jesus' dark years. We have zero records from him until his teenhood into 30 years of age. And that's when he came back checking on Joseph and Mary. The story goes he came back to uh, Palestine, Israel, whatever you want to call the Holy Land at that time. And he was like, I want to hold a baptism for myself. And every religion has a baptism. You watch these fucking occult Netflix shows, Westworld, The O. Even Black Panther had a scene of the rebirth, the baptism when you come up in the water after you take the fucking peyote like they do in those Marvel movies. And you're, you have a rebirth. It's just like you're washing over yourself. And Jesus went, learned a bunch. He's back. Maybe he stood around the burning acacia bush with Buddha over there in India. Jesus starts taking a tour around on foot, washing people's feet. And you know this is the smelliest time in history. <laughs> you wouldn't want to time travel here for this exact reason. And Jesus is looked at as a saint for washing these people up. We're getting towards the end of the first chapter. There's a little uh, word of mouth buzz going around about Jesus. The first stunt, though, that really got people talking about him was when he drove the traitors out of the temple. It was in Jerusalem, the big city, and at his home temple, he was visiting for Passover to say hi to Joe and Mary, break matzah. In the temple, he found that there were money changer plans, Jefferson called it. He was so mad he flipped the desk over. He saw that the rabbi was cutting deals with the mayor. And you know, like <laughs> separation of church and state, this corruption decays the state at its most spiritual level. And this was enough to have Jesus flip a desk over. He's pissed. He starts the movement called No Trading in the Temple. Get the money out of it. It's disorganized religion, which is kind of funny how it gives birth to the biggest religion the earth has ever seen. <laughs> a little misinterpretation of Jesus' message. He was angsty at this time, and he starts preaching hard about the Roman banking system, illegal as fuck. He was up in Galilee when John decided, this is like an uncle of his, that he wanted to be baptized to causes some division in the family and so uncle herod this is not a good guy uncle herod sold off one of his daughters to move up a little bit in his little neighborhood uncle herod got real drunk at one of these passovers and he starts hitting on one of jesus's aunts whose uh, husband had passed away so jesus is all like commandment number one it's not cool to take your dead brother's widowed wife <laughs> like Moses talked about that years ago. Jesus, he ruined the family reunion. Everyone's like, oh my God, Christ. This was our one time a year. You couldn't have just let him get laid. Jesus is like, this is incest. This is everything we stand against. <laughs> Pretty sure the Torah says we're not allowed to do that either. Jesus is ostracized from the family. Uncle Herod, Jesus thinks, hired this girl Hero Herodias to kill him, an assassin. <laughs> it's not the best origin story ever, you know? Jesus is 30 years old, he ruined the party, he runs out in his sandals, flop, flop, flop. <laughs> I ruined the party. He goes away, starts growing his hair out. Harad, he's an older man, he went to Jerusalem and became a high priest. Now Harad's pulling a little more strings and Jesus was ostracized from the family. He ran him out of Jerusalem. And this takes Jesus' life on the road, parable two, the Sermon on the Mount. Just to get his uh, speaking voice back, he gave a speech at a synagogue. It was in Capernaum. He spent a couple months there before he got on the soapbox, accruing some life experience. As soon as he started belting out, one and all, I have God's message, people knew that he was something. He spit in Torah quotes off the top of his head, riffing his homilies. He finds out he's a bomb-ass preacher, and he knows the ins and outs of the Roman banking system, so he could switch between a couple real important topics. The quote goes, They were so astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. There's a difference between when a teacher is talking and when a politician is. Like, a politician... They don't know what they're talking about, but they speak with authority like they do, so you listen. And they're saying Jesus had the knowledge of a scribe and the voice of a dictator. 
<laughs> the guy with the beard and the long hair you think is harmless, he gets on stage and he's like, listen the fuck up, the earth is going to flood again. <laughs> he's got some shit to say. His first bit that people started identifying with was he was torching the Sabbath. If you've ever seen the Orthodox Jews, if you have them in your city, long sideburns and curls, white shirts, yarmulke. On Saturdays, they can't drive their car. They can't press an elevator button. It's like all these crazy rules. It's like the virus absurdisms. You could protest. You can't eat a hamburger. It was too easy for Jesus at the time. He's pointing out all of this shit like, I can have a ham and cheese sandwich. What was Moses talking about? Salmonella isn't real. People couldn't read at the time. They were laughing their asses off. The Sabbath was as difficult as quantum theory to them. At the end of one of the shows, and this is like a biblical metaphor for Black Sabbath or something. <laughs> It was on one of the Saturdays in the Pharisee towns. I might be saying that wrong. I don't think it's Farsi. This was like the enemy. The Pharisees were the really traditional people that didn't like Jesus. So he gave a speech in a Pharisee neighborhood of Capernaum on God's given day, and he ate an ear of corn, which you're not allowed to do. This is another one of these magic rules. No popcorn on the Sabbath, and Jesus starts slobbing some corn on the cob in front of everybody. <laughs> some ladies in the crowds are fainting. <gasps> How sacrilegious. There's people throwing up. Oh, it's the Sabbath, bro. People love that bit. He started talking about David and Goliath because the Torah is basically just the First Testament. They don't believe in Jesus. They kind of copped out a religion at step one. So Jesus is ripping off those old stories, David and Goliath. He's going, if you... We are all the little man. It's not really that much of a layered analogy, but he's like, we got to steal from the gods in order to win. And he's saying, uh, stop buying into the banking system. His later metaphors will get more in depth with that. <clears throat> the big quote from this lecture was, though, Sabbath was made for man. Man wasn't made for the Sabbath. So all these little rules that we get tacked on us that make us lose our manhood, our personhood, Literally called the Lucifer effect, the antithesis of the teachings of Jesus Christ. All of these little laws that are unjust. It is not a justice system. It is a legal system. The town of Pharisee, after Jesus ate the corn, they had a, he's like, corn, K-O-R-N. He's doing alt shows right now. They held that council against Jesus, and they ran him out of town. And Jesus didn't have a posse yet, so he was total drifter. He had no one to clutch onto to stand up for him or to even get the crowd started and being like, yeah, badass, he ate the corn. He's bombing pretty hard. Jesus, this is what's called the call to the disciples. He headed up a mountain, and he prayed to God. <laughs> he was like, I need at least a few people who understand me out here otherwise. I'm going to lose it. And as the story goes, God blessed him with his entourage. He went down the mountain and there were six men waiting for him. <laughs> it was like a gay scene, a porno or something. Simon, Andrew, and James are chopping wood. John and Philip are giving a car wash. And then you got the odd one, the wild card, Bartholomew. He's got six or seven of the disciples at this point. They're following him around. He's punching up that um, Sabbath bit. Finally, he's ready for the Sermon of the Mount. This has got to be Jesus' most notable performance. You know, he's still green. He's not too beaten down by the hecklers and the critics yet. And he drops the line in this uh, Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven getting a little Buddhist on him. He's going, this might not be your life, but next time you'll get another roll of the dice. <laughs> Had a lot of good one-liners here. Woe to those that are full, for the rich one day will be just as hungry. Whoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Truth. Preach, brother. All the guys love him. He's going, okay, okay, this one is for the ladies. You guys have heard of that hack Moses with all that don't covet your neighbor's wife crap. Whosoever looked on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already in his heart. The girls are fucking going crazy. Yas! My man, I fucked the waitress the other night. He cheated on me. They're throwing their underwear at him on stage at the Sermon of the Mount. Jesus, he went on to nuke 
the Muslims in this next one. You guys have heard of an eye for an eye, right? <laughs> Whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, I turn to him the other. He's trying to make forgiveness cool again. Wait until the aggressor has the realization that they shouldn't have cut your eye out. I need to be like a nebbish Jew. Oh, I'm Jesus Christ. <laughs> Don't worry about what you eat, drink, or wear. Suffice unto the day, it's evil thereof. <laughs> He's got all these uh, little anecdotes, too, to go along with the one-liners. A lot of the prayers that you're using, it doesn't really matter what they are as long as you have the repetition. I'm telling you, he must have spent some time with Vishnu when he went to India or whatever because he's just preaching meditation to them. It's all spiritualism, self-help spiritualism. He had in this one, a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. He's trying to tie back in the taxation thing. He's like, don't do business, take loans from the state. You know, they're always going to mark up your interest. And then he ended on uh, his closer. It's got to be at the time. It's a really moving speech. People are re-energized, uh, got a new lease on life. They never heard any sort of truth like this. He says, Ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Drops the mic, surfs the crowd off. <laughs> I saw Tory Lanes at Mad Decent Block Party one time. This is like Diplo's brand of concerts. It was on Coney Island, white trash out the wazoo. Tory Lanes, he goes, All right, everybody, let me see your motherfucking hands in the air. And he starts walking on the crowd's hands. Like it was crowd surfing. And he was walking on, he was like walking on water, Jesus type of thing. I'm sure Jesus did this after the Sermon on the Mount. This is his best show ever, and after this, you can't go anywhere in the Gaza Strip, whatever this place is. <laughs> I'm a hate speecher. I'm a Zionist for knowing what Israel is. You can't leave the state without people mentioning, have you heard of that guy Christ? He's putting on a crazy show. Parable 3, Apostle Entourage. This starts the period of his life referred to as exhorts. That directly transfers to urge someone to do something. The undertone here Jefferson put out was that Jesus felt like he had a higher calling. He thought he was bequeathed unto the earth to public speak. His head is getting a little big because he's given such good sermons. He thinks he's divine. Taking his sermon from city to city. No YouTube. His ego is showing him, saying we get one of his douchiest quotes from the time. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Knees weak, arms are heavy. There's vomit on his tunic. <laughs> Mom's matzo. <mozzarella. laughs> he should have just started rapping. <laughs> a story here was a woman anointeth him, and anoint means to smear, and he's not getting a rub down. He'll get anointed by the ointment later. A chick libeled him. She set like a smear campaign out on Jesus. He was getting me too It was one of those Pharisee girls, the people that ran him out of town for eating corn. Just goes to show that old punk rock circuit is coming back to bite Jesus in the ass. The alt scene. This one particular girl, she invited Jesus over to apologize. And she gave him one of those ointment anointments, a rub down. Simon called from the other room. He had his posse as, like, uh, security guards at the time. And he whispered into Jesus before he was about to get some <laughs> Christly head. He was like, yo, the town people is saying that she's a hoe. Like, watch out. She might be trying to put you on blast. Jesus and all the disciples had to skip town the next day because she was trying to say he is not chaste. This man does not practice what he preaches. You cannot blame this man. <laughs> He's trying to free people from the debtor's prison. He's being punished for getting laid. He's not taking their hand in marriage, though. I guess that's the sin of the time. Before he made it out of town, though, from this friggin' sex kitten journalist, <laughs> he uh, got held up at knife point, and he said he got away because he quoted some sort of scripture to the 
muggers. He was like, I know you guys seek forgiveness. They drop the knife and start crying. And Jesus was like, holy shit, I could die at any moment. I need to recalibrate my sermons to what really matters. He starts talking about all the debt ponage again. He's telling people never take loans that you can't pay back. Seems like common sense. Again, these were smelly, illiterate slaves, basically. And Jesus starts spreading what was called precepts. A precept is a general rule. So that one, uh, you can't spend what you don't have, was his really big message. All of this getting ran out of town. His precepts feed into his parable of the fig tree. This is a pretty famous one. A little more famous than it should be. It's just a rich guy dialoguing with his gardener about the fig tree and it's not yielding any fruit. He's like, should we leave it for one more season? Should we uproot the fig tree? And it goes for years and years and eventually he cuts it down. The moral of the story is supposed to be fucking uproot the fig tree or don't. (laughs) You know, don't let these things bug you. And Christ is going... I know I'm like a doom and gloom preacher here, talking about the prison, the debt, but this is not everything. It's the fig tree. You need to go on with your life. Enjoy the show, but you got to go on and live your life anxiety-free. After the fig tree speech, another Pharisee took Jesus out for steaks, and everyone was real surprised at how he didn't get washed up before dinner. And for that detail to remain in the writings for 2,000 years, Jesus really must have smelt like shit. He didn't wash himself before any meal. Now, I think it was like a uh, spiritual thing where you have to clean yourself. They didn't have germ theory back then. Everyone, they used to say cleanliness is next to godliness. They didn't know why people were dying of salmonella, so they just outlawed a nice hoagie. Unfortunately, at this steak dinner where Jesus didn't wash up, the Pharisee tried to call him out. You are uh, an unclean person. I've heard what you've been doing with the other girls in the town. The big line that got everyone in the restaurant to look at Jesus as a fraud was she was like, you give all these speeches, but I haven't seen you at temple in years. (gasps) Everyone's real surprised and Jesus goes, I've spent time at the temples of the saints, ones which you will never see. He might be talking about that acacia bush where Plato saw the world of the forms, the realm of the good. (laughs) Jesus broke through to the other side. He told this chick in the restaurant, at these places I have talked to God. He has given me this message to spread to the people. What you are doing in this restaurant is the true cry for attention. Because everyone's going... Who the hell is this Jesus guy? He thinks he's the son of God. (laughs) Anybody that's saying that doesn't understand Jesus' message, the first thing he says is, we are all God's children. You are my brother. That whole son of God shit was just to sell tickets. (laughs) Luckily, Jesus has his apostle entourage throughout all of this. We're only about halfway through the chapter. This is the longest one. The parable of the sower was up after this restaurant incident. He was expected to have a show on the beach, one of his first ever outdoor venues, and he was chilling on this abandoned ship 30 meters off the coast. And everyone was like, Jesus, it's time for your show. Come out. He was scared. He was hiding in the green room, some performance anxiety. I think this is where in the Bible they say he walked on water to the shore to give his show. We're not doing all that mystical shit today. He went to the beach, he was ready, and he came back with the parable of the sower. Never, Nobody ever heard it before. It's basically the Johnny Appleseed story. Go across the country and plant a bunch of seeds. He's like, make the world better than you found it. Make the next generation not $24 trillion in debt to China. He said, as you grow your trees, as you grow the stems, which the strongest stems always grow in the oddest places, he was going, these stems will also grow thorns. The girls were loving this. He wrote, every rose has its thorn. (laughs) In this time, you were like 14 and you were procreating, so people were thinking, whoa, Jesus, he must be a faggot. (laughs) Hey, they used that word in the Bible. It is contextual today. So that whole uh, parable sower, he was saying, yes, it's good to instill your best values onto your kids. After the parable of the sower Levi, 
tagged along, I think seventh or eighth apostle, and he was vibing with them. He was a little rich kid. He invited all the disciples back to a legendary feast. They got some good meat, ordered some hookers, and a Pharisee was watching them through the vents, and he wrote a hit piece on them. Always getting caught. He just wants to have a little fun with his boys after he puts on a good show. The sermons are reaching that spiritual level where these uh, reporters, the Pharisees, the hardos are just like, shut it down. It's getting too big. People are getting tattoos of him. (laughs) Parable 4, Supernatural. Starts with the parable of new wine in old bottles. This is how you fill up a $40 wine bottle with Franzia to trick a woman into sleeping with you. Nah, I'm just kidding. That's the Satanist parable. This is uh, like the start of the stories when he starts turning water into wine, which Jefferson was giving us a new angle on it. I mean, you could believe that if you want. Every Sunday, they give you wine out of the same cup as uh, (laughs) Grandma. Good thing they closed down church for COVID. I remember going for the holy wine after an old lady and there were dentures still in the chalice. (laughs) the holy grail jefferson's take on this was it could be an allegory for christ got a little addicted to the liquid he was on the sauce (laughs) i mean think about it he's killing every show he's in a different city every night and he's putting on the same show he's like all right let's plow through this shit one more time so it really might be a story for that jesus got a new precept at this time no man should buy a new garment if he is behind on rent It's pretty simple stuff. Again, maybe because he's a wino at the time. They stab him at the end and wine comes out of his gut. (laughs) Jesus is like, you know, maybe my early shit was a little too brainy. Maybe I need to dumb it down. If you're behind on rent, you can't buy new Yeezys. (laughs) Maybe he was so drunk. (laughs) Jesus uh, went blue on stage. He's like, yeah, you fucking idiots out there. You, how much are you in debt? Oh, yeah, why don't you just swipe the card one more time? I'm sure that'll work. Jesus Augusta will pardon you. He starts, like, ripping on his audience. (laughs) See, Jesus wasn't all uh, sunshine and roses. He had some darker days. (laughs) He's definitely in a dark place, though, because one of his messages at the time is, I'm going to be gone one day. Like, everybody remember, this was the real son of God. I'm not some passing by open micer. I'm going to be gone probably soon. <laughs> it's a uh, maybe he's just getting paranoid. He's doing all these sermons throughout the land, running into Roman guards all the time. He has all 12 apostles now though, so he's got his uh protection and he's doing all of his wine walk on water tricks, so you think he'd be supernatural. Why is he still so paranoid? This weighs on him so much to the point where he gets his uh, original 12 apostles and breaks them into groups of twos. And he gives them his message. And he's like, (laughs) warning, the Jesus method gets you on a wanted list. You're going to be chased down. You're going to try to be bribed. I trust you guys with my message. He printed out his act and gave it to them. And he had to warn them about bombing. He said, uh, when people don't accept you at first, you got to shake off the dust basically just uh, putting them through a little training camp. And he said, Fear not men who can kill the body, but those who can manipulate the soul. (laughs) Can be a lot of tricky bastards out there along your journey. And this is really where Jesus gets his nickname, The Shepherd. He wasn't on a manger. He was a manager. He was uh, literally like a disinfo disseminator throughout the land. He was giving these people these messages Obviously, it was the true information at the time, though it was thought crime. Up in Galilee, the disciples would come to visit periodically. Again, Jesus not having, washing his hands during meals. All the Pharisees are writing him up. On the low, Jesus is in Galilee. This is like his hometown where he has his residency. He's got an audience that he likes to try new stuff out on, and they're cool with it. And he was uh, putting together more of a like a fucking magic show at this point he starts calling it the wicked serpent sermon (laughs) he's just got like crazy names for it and shit he's probably wearing black eyeliner he uh really starts talking again though about how 
try to get your debt revoked if you can because the deeper point here was he sees all of the debt leading back through Jerusalem. And he's like, this seems like a central banking monopoly. It could be a global degree of corruption. Maybe Jesus really did blow the whistle hard enough and that's what started all the holy wars. People were like, fuck the Roman Empire, let's just fight for 2,000 years. Maybe he stopped the original New World Order. We're counting on that second coming, Christ. (laughs) So it's going well for a minute. He's getting his magic show up to date. Uh, The original 12 meet up for another party. They need a name. The Dirty Dozen, the Tenacious 12. I'll try to keep thinking. (laughs) They have the Feast of the Tabernacles, it's called. And people were saying to Jesus, we wish we could feel your pain. And I, I don't know, man. Like... They tell you in church, well, why should I believe what they tell me in church? But they tell you in church that the first time Jesus turned the body into the bread was at the Last Supper. But it seems like at the Feast of the Tabernacle, the tabernacle is where they keep all of the bread in the church. This is the first time Jesus did that little symbolic ceremony where he's like, you want to feel my pain? I'm turning this bread into me. And then when they ate that, they all had a spiritual trip. So maybe he put like a strip of L in all of the fucking bread and they all... We're able to have a hive mind empathy trip together. <laughs> Literally every Sunday, the mo- most famous man ever, we are redoing his little act of breaking the bread. His big line at that Feast of the Tabernacle was, the world can't hate you like it hates me because I openly testify the world. Maybe he's just going, it's a son of God thing. You guys wouldn't get it. Or maybe he's saying, you guys aren't, truly staring into the abyss and when you will it will stare back and you will feel the pain at least he left the party on a good line jesus was not a nihilist he goes doth our law judgeth any man before it heareth him and now what he doeth what he doeth (laughs) he's saying what's one of the biggest crimes of humanity false imprisonment that's a absolute nightmare go listen back to albert camus the stranger (laughs) jesus is saying If I could try to put an end to suffering while I'm here, we need to save these people who are being wrongfully tried. And we'll end this chapter with the Sermon on Olive Mountain. Jesus, the twelve, breaks back up. They go uh, about the land to give his story. Jesus alone goes up to the Mountain of Olives. He gives a lecture to a dozen temples, so a really big crowd. They had to rig up an amplifier. (laughs) The Pharisees heckled him there. And there was one guy in the crowd particularly bad. He was pointing to this girl next to him in the audience. And he's going, check out this harlot. Hey, Jesus, I bet you sleep with this broad. And he's going, this girl should be stoned according to Moses. And Jesus stands up for the girl in front of the big crowd. He goes, he that is without sin amongst you all, let him cast the first stone. So Jesus is like, okay, yeah, sure. This girl deserves to die. Let's all kill her right now. The person who doesn't have any sin on them, go ahead, throw the first boulder at her eyeball. Jesus is calling him out. He's like, the point of a harlot is you're supposed to see the own deviant in yourself. You're not supposed to throw rocks at them, you idiot. He's zapping hecklers left and right, getting all that Pharisee pussy. (laughs) After the sermon, Jesus publicly approached the girl, too. Which made everyone angrier. (laughs) They're like, do it behind closed doors, please. Kind of the Sermon on Olive Mountain. He stood up for that person. And then people started asking about the blind. So rumors that he's curing the blind, too, at this time in Galilee. Um, Yeah, that's supernatural as fuck, if it's true. Parable 5, cult following. Jesus, he fashions his own allegory of the cave remix. We did that in uh, Plato's Republic. You could go back and listen. He's spending time with a shepherd girl. He's like, I want to save this girl. I want to give her all my teachings, but it seems like only those men were capable. And he knows not every man is capable. He's not saying all men are smarter than all. He's not (laughs) Jesus the misogynist. I think I see a coyote right now. Yo! Sorry about that. Jesus is a feminist ally this uh, girl on Olive Mountain he wanted to give her all of his teachings he felt like she was too naive he comes up with this analogy for some people are sheeps some people are wolves so now it's giving a new layer to his shepherd story he's like maybe I can save all the sheeps (laughs) Jesus was the first conspiracy theorist 
He's meeting a lot of small town folks while he's off the grid right now. He met another kid on a farm who was like, I want to cure the blind. You need to give me your superpowers. You're going to die one day. And Jesus was like, that's not the right idea for growing up. Like, enjoy every bit along the way. You're not going to be a a man one day and then you're going to have superpowers. Being a man sucks. He said, be patient and your opportunity to serve God will come. He was like, stay on your farm. It's beautiful here. You will learn to adore it yourself. And one day when a wanderer like myself shows up on your doorstep asking for soup, give him the fucking soup. That is your sign from God. (laughs) People are in misery. They're sleeping in bed till 12 o'clock. God, just give me a sign. And then there's a fucking hobo on their corner every day sparing for change. It's like the signs are all around you. Make of it what you can was the message there. Or if you're Sigmund Freud, the signs are just your uh, subconscious trying to communicate with you. Jesus, he's uh, pissing off the Pharisees, stuffing his face on the Sabbath. They took him to court over this at one point, and Jesus lawyered up. He took the Eighth Amendment. He did self-representation. He got a little bit of experience in the court scene. And, like, he's a public speaker. This is no difference for him. He got to be a little more argumentative because he was fighting So It gives him, dude, the fucking coyote's back. <laughs> you know, at the end of Jesus' life, they have the whole um, trial between him and Barabbas, the murderer, for who everyone wants to see go free. And so this is just to say Jesus knows how to handle himself in the court of law. <laughs> He'll be put on trial. The parable of the lost sheep and the prodigal son is when he started calling himself the shepherd in public. So he's got a stage name now. He's selling all kinds of posters for shows. He's doing, like, theaters now. He's not exactly on the arena level or doing a world tour, but this is almost as big as he gets. He gives what's called the parable of the unjust steward, talking about a guy with a mistress who milked him for all of his money, And he's saying, uh, with women like this in the world, is it uh, really punishable then to see a prostitute? It's like, you don't know who's using you for your money, and you you just want to get your fucking rocks off. Is it really that bad to use a prostitute? (laughs) This shows you where Jesus' values lied, or how intricate his moral compass was. It's not black and white. He has so many edges to him. Jesus Christ, edgelord. A controversial character arises this at this time, Lazarus. And Lazarus, <laughs> I suck at these names, man. I need a... I'm going to learn Judaism. Lazarus was kind of like Jesus. He was a sermoner, but he uh, wore purple linens. He was like the well-dressed guy who was kind of relying more on his image than on his message. And Lazarus, one day, he said that he was fighting with a deity that attacked him. So he was saying um, (laughs) he was probably tripping or something. He woke up in the woods with a dog licking him and a purple dress. And he said this was his story for why he started preaching. He just didn't put it together as well as Jesus did. Anybody could be a cult leader. What's the difference between a religion and a cult? In a religion, the founder has died. Lazarus wound up dying is put Jesus on a whole new level. They say that entertainment is a zero-sum game. If one person gets the role and you don't, it doesn't... Have... Sure, sure, yeah, it's all buddy-buddy. Lazarus died and Jesus went to the top of the charts. Jesus starts telling all of his disciples when they come through to Galilee, get people ready for the Lord. He's like, I'm coming through. Start putting the posters up. It's fucking world tour time. Takes us to parable six, shepherding allegations. Jesus got to skip town a little bit. He's a nomadic drifter. He can't stay in one place or the Pharisees will get on him. He goes to Judo and he meets up with Lady Martha there. He hits it off with her daughter named Mary, not Mary Magdalene. Mom's name was Eucalyptus. if you want to go read into that whole period of his life. The people in Judea didn't like him in the beginning. They were like, aren't you banned from 20 towns? We don't want you stirring trouble here. And so what he does, he goes and cures three blind people in the town Main Street, gains some street cred. He also had a 
eunuch, a guy that had his balls chopped off by the Romans for some bullshit charge, he apparently repaired his scrotum <laughs> and the guy was able to have a kid. So it's like the male version of the Virgin Mary, the infertile Harry. And this is when Jesus starts saying to everybody, you must not bear false witness. He's like, my message is my message only. You might have heard some apostles preaching my message before. Those guys were imposter apostles. I'm the only one. Do not worship anyone else. He's all the way in. Some people consider at this time he's like a big Hollywooder. You know, he's lost touch with the working man. And so this is when he comes up with the parable of the talents. It's about a plantation owner paying everybody for their labor rather than the same for just a day's worth of work. He thinks it should be a merit-based system, not some... And people think Jesus was a communist somehow. He's literally preaching some of the simplest tenets of capitalism. Equality, equal opportunity, not egalitarianism. Jesus, he made it through Judeo. He went to Jericho. He's just like hitting the road working on solidifying his final hour that he's about to take on the world tour. And he met Zacharias out there, who was a chief politician with the super rich. He got a little bit more info about the fake business going on and about how all of it is being, uh, again, funded through Jerusalem. This pisses Jesus off. He starts heading back to Jerusalem, the big city. The Roman state made a new decree where if you worship any of the unapproved gods you were going to be kicked out of the you could be eunuched as well they'll cut your balls off if you go to a jesus show censorship is a slippery slope well caesar augustus is making all these petty laws just so that people can't go out and see these new entertainers and then the real historians of uh, like the year zero are saying there were 30 people out there using the name jesus and maybe it was the apostles or maybe there were just a bunch of guys exploiting the system saying, is it really exploitation if you're just using satire? <laughs> it's just like today, man. There's all the little rules. You can only make a living, be as free as they will let you be. And they're taking that away from Jesus. And obviously Jesus is selling more tickets than ever. This makes him a little taboo, a little counterculture. And people are like, this guy, he's metal again. He's doing it. Jesus was going, you hear about this pussy Caesar trying to cancel me? Everyone's roaring in the audience. Fuck him. Jesus would say, let Caesar do his own campaigning. If this guy really had a message that the world needed to hear, he also would have recruited six or seven brothers worth dying for his message to go around the land. But I thought Jesus prayed for those apostles. He got that on the his dad his trust fund dad bought him that bot farm those apostles to go and preach for him <laughs> so jesus doing really big shows around uh jerusalem saying fuck you to the system they know that he's still out there doing shows they sent a scribe out to get a quote from jesus like they put him on late night they gave him two minutes of air time one line to say his message and Jesus said, there is only one God you must love above all with your mind, your soul, and your body. <laughs> exactly against that decree Caesar made. He's going, I know the one God, and this is the one that you have to surrender to for anything to make sense. <clears throat> Parable 7, the last supper that starts with the widow's might. Jesus was chilling at the treasury, the place where everybody basically went to either pay their taxes or collect their dole. And he noticed that an old lady consistently, she had nothing. She came in and she donated what she had every single week. And Jesus notoriously did this. He didn't keep what he made. He donated everything. I know he's being a nosy hippie at the time, but you would too. This makes him start resenting his own disciples. He's like, I gave you God's message to go out there. You're making money with it. And you guys aren't doing shit to help the community. I got this old lady here who's about to die any second and she's giving everything back. Pretty noble of him. It puts him in a dark place seeing the true nature of humanity. Jesus is like, fuck this, I'm fleeing to the mountains. He actually made it to Judea for a while. He had all that steam rolling in Jerusalem with those big shows. 
And he's like, these people are disgusting. Remember he has that drunk audience from before? He's like, God, if you're doing one of those floods, I'm up in the mountains. Do it right now. He writes some risque tales up there. Starts making his message more critical again, a little bit more obvious. He writes the parable of ten virgins... These assholes just want to have sex and hoard all their money. All right, I'll put the message in their terms. It's not that different than like the 72 virgin tale. Jesus goes, all right, heaven is likened to 10 virgins. And all the guys are like, yeah, do a beer joke. He says, five of the virgins are wise. Five of the virgins are foolish. In heaven, one day your oil lamp is going to run out and you got to ask one of these chicks to borrow their oil. It sounds awful. I go to heaven and I still got to go to the oil store every week. Can I skip to heaven too? What the fuck? And Jesus was like, who are you going to ask? One of the dumb broads or one of the smart girls if you could borrow their oil? The girls who give their oil up are not going to have any at the end of the day for themselves. And he's like (laughs) finally turning on the prostitutes going, you guys need an escape from the game. What's your exit plan? He's uh, saying... Okay, maybe I have found the uh, negative to buying a prostitute. Sure, it's empowering and everything, but these girls are giving up their oil, whatever you want to call that. How many guys do you know out there who is trying to marry a sex worker? You know what we're saying here? Jesus is uh, flipping on his own message. He's just growing up. He's gone through like the entire character development as an entertainer he's going into his own emotions his own kinks his use of prostitutes and putting it on public for everyone to see with a greater message this guy's the best entertainer of all time instead of spending five thousand dollars on an acting or like an entertainer class just read jesus's story jesus is Sad. He's like, I'm ready to die for my message at this point. The world is not going to change. They need to see me suffer to understand that I mean my message now. And so Jesus calls everybody back to Jerusalem for the last supper. He wants to have one last hurrah. And at the dinner, (laughs) it's fun. They're all drinking their wine, but Jesus is a little eerie. He's like, you know, this is fun and all. One of you guys are definitely going to betray me. Judas slumps down in his seat. They all pose for Da Vinci's painting on one side of the table. That's where I said before, we don't know if that's where the first breaking of the bread is. I think it'd be even more powerful if that was the second time. He was like, guys, remember the early days? Remember when you were just getting started on the road? And then we all met up and I did that thing where we broke the bread. And they're like, yeah, that was the good time. We didn't have any response, blah, blah, blah. And then Jesus does it again now. It comes full circle. So Jesus breaks the bread. He skips town because he knows that he is wanted. Someone's going to rat him out. And thus ends the Last Supper, bringing us to our final parable, number eight, betrayal. So Jesus is out of town. The old Judas Iscariot, he went to the chief priestess in Jerusalem and was like, I'll deliver Jesus to you if you give me 30 pieces of silver. And they're like, of course, I would have given you a million pieces. The symbolism there is that 30 pieces of silver is what a slave cost back in that day. And so all the real disciples went out to Bethany with Jesus. And they went and got their feet washed there. They went to have a little spa day for the boys because only Jesus knows he's about to get brutally crucified. And everyone's like, whoa, this is fun, Jesus. We got to do this more. He's like, yep, my last spa day ever. And Simon goes, wait, where's Judas? And Jesus has to break it to them. He's like, I told you, what of you wasn't going to be here for me? Judas is back in Jerusalem selling his soul. And uh, he also called out Peter at the time. He's like, Peter, you're greedy. You never donated a dime. <laughs> you're fake news. <laughs> Nothing really there. Peter maybe um, would have been the second rat if Judas held out was more of a man. So while the boys are at the spa, Jesus was like, I can feel it. It's calling. It's time for him to go back to Jerusalem. This is when he does that 40-day trek through the desert. And then again, the spiritual parts, he apparently meets the devil there and all that crap. Jefferson, not including any of that. He gets back to Jerusalem 
and he is uh, arrested after the garden. They take him to the priest's high command, and then they put him on trial with him and Barabbas, and they're putting on a big show. They're like, we finally got him. We got the imposter. You think this guy is a fucking deity? And they punch Jesus in the face. They see him bleed. Does an immortal bleed? And Jesus is like, I told you I'm man. I'm just the son of God. (laughs) Nobody gives a fuck. Everybody wants to see Barabbas let free a murderer, whereas Jesus was just making a show with his own ideas, entertaining people. And so the spectacle of death has to take place. They were hyping up catching Jesus for so long. They beat him within an inch of his life while he's naked in front of everybody. Peter was the first to comfort him after this. And Peter was like, you're right, dude. I feel your pain right now. I should have donated. If that was me, if I was the one to die, I would have wished that I gave more back. And Jesus was like, you learned your lesson. I said only one of you would betray me. I love you, Peter. I'll see you on the other side. Jesus is beaten to look like a friggin' pig carcass. He isn't able to walk. They have to carry him over to Paunch's pilot. And this is a crazy scene. If you are a churchgoer, you know this is the most climactic part of church. It's around Easter time. Jesus is a fucking pulp, and he's in the middle of the judgment hall. They're trying to make him defend himself. Pilate is like, this is your king. This is the king of the Jews? Get a load of this guy. He calls out to the crowd the best part in church. What do you want to see? He's holding his thumb out in the middle, dangling it between up and down like in the gladiator arena. In church, they do this scene. It's the most cathartic you will feel in a temple. (laughs) Everybody in unison chants, Crucify him! Crucify him! Feels pretty good. Maybe if I was incarnated in year zero, I would have been these people spitting on him. (laughs) Imagine what ring of hell you go to if you spit on Jesus. Pontius was not giving it to him easy. This is where, if you've ever seen the Passion of the Christ, they flog him, beat him, again spit on him within an inch of his life. And while Jesus is basically dead, the rumor had it, he like cut off his ear and gave it to one of the high priests and was like, I told you, no one was going to listen to me. That was symbolic. Makes you think about Vincent Van Gogh. That dude uh, chopped his ear off and sent it to his ex. <laughs> what is he trying to uh, <laughs> send a bigger message or just an unhinged artist? Paunches after the ear. He calls on Herod to come and see Jesus. Do we remember old Uncle Herod? That evil asshole, drunk uncle. He's all like, damn, Jesus, I've been hearing these stories about you. I guess your aunt was right. You are a little prick. He thought he was going to give him a little bit of props for curing the blind and the lepers. But no, Herod is rotten until the end. He will be damned in the final judgment. Big thing there was Jesus took an oath of silence when Herod was a dick to him. He's like, if my own kin won't get the message, it's time to die. And Jefferson didn't really get into the carrying of the cross to the hill, which if you had a time machine, this would be like one of the preset buttons in the elevator time machine. Crucifixion. You want to see Jesus carrying the cross, the people wiping his forehead. Some people are crying, like understanding his message, and then some of them throwing tomatoes at him. That is a tense moment in history. I could feel it right now. While Jesus was carrying the cross... Judas, he tried to go to the priesthood and return his 30 pieces of silver. He's like, I'm sorry, I I don't even want this anymore. And the clergy was like, we don't want that fucking blood money, man. That You saw what Jesus did. You are cursed. Judas went out to hang himself. I guess there is justice in the end. Jesus, they uh, nail him to the cross. Pilate picked out that I-N-R-I sign above his head. Here lies Jesus, King of the Jews. He spends 72 hours on the cross, and on the third day, he yells out, My God, why have you forsaken me? And then he dies. Mary Magdalene and all the Galilee girls are weeping at his feet. One of the guards come by and stab him in his ribs, and wine comes out. Legendary booze bag. 
again, this is the real story. We're not going to do the crucifixion and all of that crap. Joseph and Arrhythmia come and take his body off the cross. They move him into the cave. They put myrrh in it. Born with the myrrh, you'll die with the myrrh. And Nicodemus showed up. I should tell people that's my name when they say, what is Nick short for? Nicodemus. It's got two C's. It's the thick Nick. That guy, he bought a hundred pounds of ointment and aloe for the body. They basically made it a mummy. They wrapped Jesus with linens and spices. Maybe they were trying to cook him. And they put him in the cave and inlet untouched by man. And then they wheeled a giant rock in front. That's uh, as much of a miracle as the rebirth, how two guys pushed a five-ton piece of granite in front of. (laughs) We're not here to poke holes in the Bible. We're here to make fun of it. That's basically the Jeffersonian Bible, ladies and gentlemen. Those are the teachings of Jesus Christ. Forgive. Don't spend what you don't have. Love everyone. Forgive your enemy. Turn the other cheek. Go give it another listen. That is going to be our Christmas-themed show for the month. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thomas Jefferson, for the country and for this Bible as well. That guy definitely sowed some seeds, made the future a better place. That is going to take us to next week. We are going over Douglas Murray's The Madness of Crowds. He has been making his way around the media circuit at the moment. And he is one of the best provocateurs of the time and a damn good author. I would highly suggest this book, The Madness of Crowds, details how Douglas Murray is a gay man. He's a Brit. He's well put together. He (laughs) embodies that cleanliness is godliness. And he talks out against the LGBTQ community. He's talking about the powers that be are organizing the closet. It is all this infighting. It used to be all the gay people at the Stonewall riot standing together, but now you have become political pawns. Are you a trans? Are you a Q? You've seen the Dave Chappelle bit. They're all in the car yelling at each other. A lot of division going on. He gets into women. He gets into transsexuals. I'm telling you, he is out there to stoke the fire. A provocateur in the best sense of the word, kind of like Jesus. Again, let's pour one out for him. That's going to be next week, the madness of crowds. Jesus, I'll send a prayer up for you soon, my dude. I love you all for staying tuned, all races of the world, for experiencing someone else's culture. Thank you, guys. I am Nick Muniz. See you in a week. Peace.